All right, welcome back, class, uh, to today's session. Uh, we are now in the next P, which is the place element of the marketing mix. As you can see, since we started, we have actually delved into quite a number of you know uh, areas in marketing, and we came down to you know addressing the number of P's. Obviously, uh, the last session we did the promotion bit or the advertising uh, to represent the, the, the P, the promotion P. Now, today we are looking at distribution of financial services, which is obviously the place element in the marketing mix. Again, uh, one would say that it's one of the very important, you know, element in the, in the marketing operations because, yes, having actually developed the product, having actually priced it, of course, the point is how do you get it to the consumer? You know, so the place element or the distribution element is quite critical. Now, when it comes to financial services, it looks to be a very complex you know, operation when it comes to the distribution. Obviously, complex because we know the characteristics of services being intangible, being heterogeneous, you know, uh, being uh, what do you call a uh, perishable. So quite a number of characteristics of services make the distribution element a little bit dicey, a little bit complex, because how do you distribute something that can't be handled, i.e. something that can't be touched? You know, how do you actually ensure that something that can't be touched can still be you know, on the shelf, so to speak, you know, for people to assess it? So the distribution element, it's quite dicey, it's quite complex, but it's one that is also very fundamental to marketing. Otherwise, you've got to actually get a stack in your office without anybody knowing about it. So you can make all the noise in terms of promotion. If you don't have a very robust, comprehensive way of distributing the service or the product, then of course, you're not gonna get it marketed. So the distribution element is very, very crucial to, to marketing. As usual, we have the session overview, and then we have the, you know, uh, what do you call the session outline that actually talks about, you know, uh, the various distribution elements for uh, the various, you know, financial services. Now, usually, yeah, as usual, the reading list, we have it there. Now, if you look at the, the nature of financial services, and like you know, I intimated earlier on, because of the, the dynamics of it, because of the characteristics of the financial services, you can't really separate the people that actually function as distributors from the systems. You know, so the people themselves, i.e. the employees, the workers, and everybody else, serve as a distribution element. Now, again, they use the systems to distribute. So sort of uh, the systems and the people element are actually intertwined as a comprehensive mode for distributing financial, you know, uh, what we call product. And then again, once they actually distributing it, as we know as a uh, character of services where consumption, uh, the supply and consumption actually taking place at the same time. Once the, the distribution is ongoing, perhaps, I mean, the, 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 the consumer is also what consuming the product at the same time. So if you look at the characteristics of financial services market, we have the direct distribution mode and we have the indirect distribution mode. Now direct because you know the distribution comes from the originator, that is the company that is actually responsible for the brand or the service brand. Now they actually distribute or they go ahead to make available the financial services or the financial product to the consumer. And a number of you know uh, ways you have in the company's own sales force, which is uh, the company's own people, you know, making available the the product or the services to the consumer. You have the internet that has grown to be one of the most you know, important source of distribution to companies, including financial services. And then we have retail branch, you know, you have telemarketing, banking by phone, and other methods, 
you know predominantly have grown especially these it related ones have predominantly grown to be very very vital to businesses now these days we are also talking about the use of micro blocks or social media platforms as key to distributing financial you know services now you can buy on twitter you can actually acquire financial services through face facebook and other micro blogging sites so that's a the important trend that we're actually witnessing you know uh, in recent times now we also have the indirect distribution where distribution can take place through agents through brokers other companies branch operations for example you can have maybe an insurance being distributed through a bank so the insurance company may have a partnership arrangement or some kind of collaboration between them and a bank and then the bank go ahead to do what to distribute the particular product again we have we, uh, what do you call we have travel and tour operators who are not financial services institutions but they still sell travel insurance content insurance and things like that to to customers as third parties and then we have the outsource telemarketing where some companies predominantly actually outsource what is not their core competent so they want to concentrate on what they do best and then outsource you know the core handling bit to you know other companies to to do that so again we have that as a mode of uh, indirect distribution so clearly we can see this type of distribution you know systems now that is not to say that company decides only to use direct or decide only to use indirect there's most cases a mixture of both in a mixed bag companies predominantly mix it so that they can actually enhance you know the service experience because if your sales force aren't in or they happen to be on strike now are you able to use the other element as a very very you know good platform to still let your you know services to be patronized without being affected negatively now if your internet site is down what do you do you know with the other so in most cases it is advisable that companies actually mix their channels so that they can effectively deliver services without you know any hindrance now two general approaches to distribution like we have talked about the direct and indirect you know uh, approaches whereby the direct carried out by the company owned employees and things like that where direct purchase of insurance policy on the phone you know online insurance codes and etc i mean we've talked about that earlier on again we can see the same you know diagrams i mean the same uh, kind of the direct and indirect distribution diagram here so you have an insurance company that actually distribute through its own agents to consumer insurance company through internet and phone to consumer insurance company using broker so you have insurance company abc all using a broker to consumer insurance company to retail bank to consumer same approaches we can see here with the banking in, uh, industry or uh, the banking sector so you have a bank and own branch to consumer bank through own atm to consumer bank through competitors atm to consumer bank through the internet to consumer and like we said the micro blocks are also available now that you know companies are using to distribute information at the same time the product you know to clients or to customers now again technology based channels so these are channels predominantly are technology based atms phones internet etc and then traditional means agent and broker we can see that commercial banking has extensively expanded its portfolio of distribution in the networks or distribution platforms in a more than any other uh, they have predominantly been relying on the technology base lately whereby the others are also mixing up but then they are not so much you know technology driven so we can say that commercial banking has really made a jump or a big leap in terms of the uptake of technology or the diffusion of technology 
Now, we are almost talking about VTM as opposed to ATM, where we're now going to see commercial banks or, uh, you know, the traditional ATM being changed into video in a telemarketing instrument, where you don't actually, you know, just press it, but you can see the interaction, you can see the product, you can choose, and then you can actually interface with a bank through a video technology systems as opposed to ATM. So this is how, you know, kind of a technology is actually being used in the banking sector especially. And I think there are quite a lot of, you know, uh, engineering of uh, distribution channels going on. And very soon I'm sure we'll see predominantly new technologies come into the fore. Obviously we talked about the f speed banking with, you know, text messages and things like that. Barclays launched Pingy, Pingit, you know, where you can actually use text messages to transfer funds from one account to the other. And it's been very, very successful. We have a, a what do you call, First Capital Plus, and it's speed banking, you know, text message platform. Very popular amongst its customers, very efficient, very effective. And I think we're gonna see quite a number of, you know, some of these developments in the market going forward. Now, again, the same diagram as we saw with the you know, agency, company, customer, and things like it. Now, one of the challenges in the distribution of financial services has been, you know, whether agents, especially, for example, you know, are, are able to discharge their duties to the benefits of the company and to the customer, you know, and, and to reduce the impact of adverse selection, the impact of moral hazard and things, which are you know, telling the, you know, on the company's operation. So moral hazard is one of the challenges. Moral hazard simply means that you know, people would sort of conceive or would kind of conceal, sorry, conceal some information in order to you know, acquire policy, for example, insurance policy, or in order to acquire a loan. It's, it's, it's a big, big issue, you know, when it comes to the challenges in financial services. So you can see that insurance company, agent, and consumer. And we say the moral hazard occurs when an intermediary, example, an agent, broker, etc., is placed in a position to negotiate the key attributes of financial product, example, price, policy limits, on behalf of the financial services organization. So examples of where the intermediary could do harm. So this one, Actually, sorry, this one, moral hazard, is about they, the, the, the agent, for example, you know, charging too low a price in order that what they can get a policy, you know, or, you know, not doing due diligence in order that they can get a policy. So the person goes through the credit checks or, uh, you know, some kind of risk assessment with the consumer or the client and doesn't actually do it well to really find out what is actually the problem or the risks of this client. Go ahead to sign the client and put to the program or to the policy. And then it turns out that the person has a high risk, but it has been evaluated as a low risk you know, client or customer. So it is one of the very, very challenging issues in financial services, selling policies to high risk prospects you know, when they're not supposed to, or when they have to pay a higher premium, you know, switching customer to a competing provider. And we have seen that quite a lot, even in the, in the telecommunications, as well as banking. Some agents, you know, uh, or for insurance companies, decide to switch customers or accounts, you know, here and there, just because of the commission that they want to, to get out of it. And selling the customer an uncompetitive product, again, it had been an issue where agents decide to or try to make sales, and then try to present uncompetitive, you know, offers to consumers. In the end, consumers, when they come and find out about it, or when they come to find out about it, they become, you know, disappointed towards the brand, you know, itself. That's the unfortunate one. So these are some of the things that we actually witness in moral hazard. Now. The challenge is how do we deal with that? And I'm sure we'll actually come to that challenge. You know, again, methods for dealing with moral hazards, we're saying that requiring exclusive franchise agent contract which hold 
agents accountable for customer transaction quality. Of course, I mean, the point is, if you use one agent and then the contract between you and that agent is exclusive, the person knows that they are the only one responsible for what your brand. I think that it can go a long way to reduce you know, uh, moral hazard because they get convinced, they get uh, what you call uh, uh, assurances that they can get continuous business with you. And I think that exclusivity right actually protects them you know, from competition. And as a result, they do due diligence because if they then don't work properly, then what happens is that they could lose that right. So perhaps agents may be much more responsible when they know that they have an exclusive right you know, with a particular, you know, uh, insurance or banking, you know, uh, company. And then monitoring, we constantly have to monitor transactions closely. You know, sometimes you may want to do random checks, you know, without necessarily, you know, the agent necessarily knowing that you're going to actually do that. Now, it puts people on their toes, you know, when they know that there's random checks, you know, that you do and then you don't know which account you know, the company will pick up to observe or to monitor. So again, monitoring is very close one. It's very, very, you know, uh, what do you call, good me method of checking, you know, moral hazards. We also have uh, the use of technology. Of course, are we able to successfully replace agents or third parties with technologies? We've been successful with ATM, but of course we haven't actually done away with the interpersonal one or the personal selling one still the atm is there but yet we still use what interpersonal you know means of you know selling and means of you know uh, distributing financial product so yes we can think about technology but we may not entirely remove the human face out of you know financial services distribution and then there is selling to customers to bypass agents of course we can also do that but becoming, or the industry being very, very competitive, you know, whereby staff are actually poached here and there, whereby consumers are actually becoming, you know, kind of apathetic to industry. Now, agents are becoming predominantly powerful. They're becoming very, very powerful in the system because consumers themselves don't have time to be dealing with some of these things. Brokerage and, uh, uh, brokerage and, and the agents actually serve as a very good link between them and the industry. And then, of course, let's look at the complexities of the financial services product. Not many people have the expertise to weave through the complexities of financial services and to actually you know, push their case themselves. So most of the times, they prefer agents who they may see as what honest, you know, kind of, you know, uh, what you call a link between them and the consumer and then and the company. Now, if you have to deal with the company's own sales staff, some companies may not necessarily think that you will be an honest broker. So they will prefer a third party who is not necessarily tied to the business and who can actually negotiate fair deals on their behalf. So I think that. The agents are actually gaining more grounds, so we may decide to employ some direct sales people to deal with consumers, not directly, but to what extent can we actually do that? But of course, it's another way of doing it. Now, higher base salary for the agents. Again, you may decide to curb the problem of moral hazard by paying the agents something you know, uh, tangible, something you know, appreciable. You know, that would make them responsible to make sure that they can only come with only quality you know, uh, customers. Now, having said that, you can also put certain punitive measures you know, so that when people actually come out with you know, accounts that happen to have moral hazards or you know, moral hazard oriented account, they could be responsible for their own actions. So I think that could also work better in checking these, these issues. Now, conflict of interest in distribution of financial services also exists, and we have seen over time churning. Churning means customer uh, agents or brokerage uh, agents actually tend to you know, transfer or trade accounts, customers, from one company to the other, all in the hope or in the anticipation of gaining commission. 
So you have brokers conducting excessive trades on an account to gain what? Commission. So they will sell this account or they will take this account to this company the next time they are moving it from here to another company just because they can actually earn commission on that. Tying, tying is where you know uh, a company or a bank forces a customer to take on other services or deny a prospect a loan unless they sign up for an additional you know, services. So they can say that a personal protection plan, that's PPP for example, you know, when you take a loan, you take PPP as, a, as, a, as an insurance. So just in case you're not able to meet your loan repayment obligations, the PPP can kick in. Now, some bank can actually tell you that, yes, if you don't take up the PPP policy, then of course your loan may, be, may be denied. So, or even that perception alone exists. So that is how you know the tying in, you know, actually in you know, a work. People will try to tie in a particular product to, like insurance, for example, to a loan agreement. And then revenue sharing is revenue sharing is where brokerage firm charge fund companies fees to get their funds on a preferred list. So obviously the brokerage or the uh, the brokerage firm is supposed to list some, you know, or supposed to list down. Uh, fund managers, for example, so people can choose, but they try to create their own preferred list where they send it to, you know, to to clients, you know, to you know, sort of uh, put in their foot, you know, ahead of the rest of the the pack. Now, once they get that, you know, they expect some revenue sharing from the fund companies, and that's also a challenge, because of course then it becomes the one who pays more, perhaps would actually get the preferred list, but not necessarily the one who serves better the consumer's interest. Directed, you know, uh, brokerage, again, mutual fund companies channeling some of their trades with a given brokerage firm in return for brokerage firm featuring the fund, you know. And then we have contingent commissions, just like kickbacks, kind of kickbacks that, you know, or some additional money that these agents actually get paid contingent to channeling large businesses you know, to them. So you get a large business, they give them some inducement. Again, these are challenges because then of course, it is about who pays big you know, and who actually, you know, than who actually serves better the interest of the consumer. Now, adverse selection is, is when, again, the customer had been dishonest in terms of disclosures, you know, of you know their 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 information, so a case when the acquired customer does not meet the firm's profit and risk objectives, often as a result of misrepresentation of information by the customer or the agent. So the agent or the customer can misrepresent you know, information, and that is actually adverse selection, because again, once the risk profile is not properly known, the customer or the agent may, uh, the consumer may not actually pay the prescribed you know premiums as a result it becomes uh, an issue to the company when it's later found that obviously they had a higher risk than they thought earlier on so poor health history term life insurance high risk uses of a vehicle so the person uses the vehicle for long journeys and so oh, i use it for internal you know right and that's a misrepresentation or bad credit history so they check the credit history note due diligence is done, but then they push ahead with a home mortgage when the customer had a very bad credit history. I think this is what actually happened to the credit crunch when we had a lot of uh, Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac have an issue with this, you know, the, what we call subprime. You know, people were not duly checked in terms of risks, in terms of credit checks and they ended up having mortgages that were higher even sometimes two three times higher than their you know actual income and they couldn't actually meet the mortgage ob obligations most of them were had to, were had to had to be boarded you know you know they have to be you know kind of reversed and then be sold to other markets and it became a whole huge issue you know as you know with a credit crunch so that's very very tough challenge for the financial services in the industry. 
Now, facts related to the distribution of financial services. This, we're saying that approximately 70% of Ghanaians are unbanked, and that were actually highlighted in research you know, done by PwC. There's, there are so many Ghanaians that are unbanked. You know. However, perhaps you can say that some of them, most of them are actually being taken care of by the, the growing microfinance and other you know, non-banking non institutions or you know, in, in the country at the moment. Now, insurance companies predominantly use third parties to sell policies. Of course, we have seen the growth of the brokerage and the, agents, the agency, where a lot of them now are being sold, you know, insurance are being sold by these people. But we have also seen the rise of the mobile phones selling insurance. I mean, we have Airtel Insurance, we have you know, all the other companies also selling insurance product, which is also a new kind of trend because we never used to have that. Now you have these companies selling. And then in general, large banks charge more for their services, questioning the motivations behind bank consolidation. Well, there had been this idea that the consolidation of financial institutions would bring in a value to the customer or would reduce cost of money. Clearly, financial services, you know, I mean, big players haven't actually done that. There hadn't actually been evidence of you know, how the cost could be reduced for the consumer as the banks consolidate. Obviously, they, they, they would argue that they have multiple platforms through which the customers are being, I mean, serve, being served, and as a result, they've got to actually pass on the cost you know, to someone else. So determining the size of the distribution channel. Now, how big should your distribution channel for example, how sh big should your call center be in terms of man hours or in terms of the people who actually man the systems? Now, how big should your, you know, your in-bank in, in you know, front line or tell us be you know, when you're actually setting up? Now, you cannot actually come uh, to, to the answer with just abstractions. You, know? you couldn't say, oh, yes, let's have five tellers, ten tellers, or let's have you know, 15 call center advisors and things. You can't just say that. You know, there has to be a science towards it. How do you determine how big your workforce is? You know, should be in relation to what is the size of your consumer or your client base? And then what is the size of your, the, the, the market, for example? You can also see how, man, how many times do they get in touch or do they contact the business? And as a result, with this, you can actually have a very good human resource plan going forward. So we're saying that to determine the size of it, you want to look at the number of customers that need to be served you know, within a particular time. Number of times an average customer visits or requires sales calls per year or requires some sort of services. You know, a number of calls visits processed every year by the average customer service person. So we're saying that by putting these things through, you can have a formula as a number of staff needed, as N, N being the number of customers that need to be served, multiplied by T, T being the number of times an average customer, you know, visit or require sales calls per year, and then you have number of, yeah, a uh, number of calls visit process every year by the average customer service person being the C. So N multiplied by T over you know, C would actually give you, you know, the number of staff you require. So a little bit of example here. Um, we have 5,000 customers, which is the N. That is the number of customers we have. Each customer, on the average, visits us three times a year, which is your T. The average customer service employee processes 1,000 customers' inquiries a year, which is your C. So it will be, the number of staff required will be 5,000 multiplied by three divided by 1,000, and that gives you 15 people. So we are saying that with 15 sales staff, or with 15 in the customer service staff, you will be able to do a service or serve 5,000 customers a year. So that is the very simplistic, you know, kind of, you know, uh, model that you can actually use. But of course, there could be 
other inner challenges that you need to factor in. Of course, this is on the assumption that you know all the customers would be with you. It's an assumption that you're going to maintain within the year 5,000 customers. When we know that with competition, you can either lose them or gain more you know, within that period. Again, we're assuming that the number of times people would actually you know, deal with you will remain constant, you know, and all those things. And then we're assuming that, of course, with the 15 staff that you have, they will be you know, constantly coming to work <laughs> on time and for the entire 365 days. Obviously, there are human you know, resource challenges that you have to you know, anticipate. So, but of course, that doesn't actually you know, say that the formula is, is, is flawed. You know, it is a perfect, you know, not perfect, but at least it is something that you can use to gauge you know, your staff requirements you know, going forward. Determining the scope of distribution. So how, what should be the scope of our distribution channels? What do we have to use you know, in order that we can effectively serve you know, customers and efficiently manage resources? Now, the scope, how widely is a financial product service available across different types of distribution channels? You know, so how widely is our service you know, available across different distribution channels like in the telephone, online, in bank, and other you know, sources? Scope of financial services distribution has increased in recent years due to the use of technology, of course. So with a traditional means of serving you know, clients, whether through internal banking, through agent or brokerage and things, we also have extensive, like we have said, the internet or the technology playing a very you know, an instrumental part in the service distribution. So we have telephones, or what we call the self-service systems, you know, we have telephones, we have websites, we have the micro blocks, all you know playing key parts in that. And then of course we even have teletext, you know, where people can actually access services. Now, scope can be expanded through mergers and acquisitions. Of course, when companies merge, they adapt, you know, you know the systems available, you know, from uh, what do you call the the purchased or the acquired business. And again, it is a good way of what, getting access to a particular technology if you don't actually have it. Too wide a scope can compromise customer service quality, of course. You know, usually what happens is that if you don't have good structures in place where all these systems could be effectively you know, managed, integrated into the cost companies in the distribution systems, you could have variations in terms of customer experience. So you may be doing very well when it comes to in-bank in you know, experience, but when you call or when a customer make a call to the branch, then there's a problem because, of course, you have only a few people manning the funds. So once someone is engaged, customers can't get through another. So you would have to really pay attention and make sure that the resources are equitably distributed so that people can you know, uh, uh, effectively engage all your platforms available. I mean, to what extent do you have an effective, or to what extent does your internet support, you know, your service, for example? You know, do people really get frustrated when they're trying to log in online as opposed to calling on the phone? Now, if the experience online is bad, well, you can have a very fantastic experience over the phone, but the preferred point of, you know, contact by this particular customer is online. So you may have a fantastic on the phone, you know, kind of uh, telemarketing systems. Once your online is, is, is rubbish, it will be very, very impactful on your brand. So when you're using multi-channel, bear in mind that, you know, having so many can compromise it. But of course, that doesn't say that because of that, you have to use too few. The, the challenge is that you've got to actually make sure you're managing them equally and making sure that customers are having excellent experience equal. So expected trends in the distribution of financial services. So we're saying that these trends or these things are likely or are there things that are actually happening in the industry. Increasingly we see the reduction in face-to-face -face, you know uh, selling. Now gone are the days we have quite a lot of people you know, especially when it comes to insurance. 
you know, going around house to house, you know, trying to sell insurance to, to customers or to people. Now, that has tremendously been reduced. You know, we see a lot of phone calls and then salespeople or maybe a broker actually come to your office. When we used to have so many of them you know, going around and things, you know, again, we've seen tremendously the, the use of a third party, like insurance being sold through banks. So people have actually acquired most of their insurance through banks, as opposed to personal selling by a, a, an insurance company's sales force or sales staff. So there had been a decrease in of that particular, you know, face-to-face, one-to-one, you know, kind of contact using personal salespeople, and then other channels actually, you know, taking place. Of course, that is not to say that there's an entirely in the removal of that human factor face to face, but we're saying that there has been a decline of you know personal selling, you know banks using their own, or uh, well, insurance companies using their own staff, for example. But then there's also an online banking expected to witness steady growth, supplementing not replacing retail banking. So yes, we have seen the in- the increase, you know, the 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 gradual creeping in of online. Now this hadn't really taken off. You know, in our context, because of other system challenges and infrastructure, you know, challenges, still we have appreciable level of internet access, but we haven't really gotten to where we want to be. Internet access is very, very, you know, intermittent. I mean, it's very, very disrupted. You know, people really can get satisfaction through. So they still use the in-banking, you know, kind of a, a approach or method. But yes, we see quite a number of uh, uh, growth in the online as compared to what it used to be. Technology, of course, uh, the use of ATMs, you know, to replace the human face or the human based transactions has grown, but again, it had not actually replaced uh, uh, that human interface, like we said. And an emerging question, how do you build a relationship marketing program with no human interaction? Again, we say that with the increasing use of technology, it means that the kind of relationship that we build, the bond that we build between the consumers and companies, obviously, we build it through human interaction, through human in the, uh, contact. So if we're increasingly relying on technology, does it mean that we're going to actually lose that relationship, you know, building, you know, uh, kind of opportunity? Well, some companies have tried to make sure that they can actually scale that problem by having some kind of human interaction technology, you know, where you actually log in and there's a there's a an avatar or some kind of human being say, oh, hello, how are you? you know, how can I help you with Yes, that has been done, but of course is that enough? And as a result, people, you know, arguing that I think it's good for companies to have a a broader approach. So you can have maybe a center or a head office that actually has all these human contact kind of systems and people can interact with the technology as well whereby you know as they interact with the technology for certain you know problems or for certain needs they can come to the office to actually have that relationship with the company. Others have actually constituted some programs where yes you interact with the systems but then occasionally they organize some kind of meet, you know, meet up or some kind of, you know, call it um, an activation of some sort or, you know, some seminars or some conference, just to bring the consumers and the company together, you know, for that bonding. So companies have actually tried some use of, you know, approach or some approaches to keep the bonding, you know, going or to keep the human face going without necessarily losing it or without actually losing it and then making it affect the relationship between them and the client. Expected trends again, we're saying that consumers' awareness and education about financial instrument is increasing. That's clearly the case, you know, unlike those days. But still, we still have information asymmetry where predominantly the providers or the suppliers of the service are, pre- are, are, are very, very, you know, uh, aware, are very, very knowledgeable of a product, and then consumers are still not getting their heads around what 
the financial services because of the complexities of it. So we still need to do some education so that we can increasingly you know, enhance the knowledge bit you know, on the side of the consumer. Personal selling still need, needed for product that require a high level of customization. Like we said, the company may be using the mixed bag of distribution, but then they will still keep the personal selling bit so that just in case somebody needs special attention or some you know, kind of customized you know, services, they could still have access to the people. And offshore outsourcing, like we said, quite a number of companies have also moved abroad you know, they try to move their, you know, service centers to elsewhere where they can have cheap labor and therefore it can actually affect, affect the cost of, you know, service or the cost of production for customers' value, you know, and that is also, you know, sort of one of the trends. But here also, let me say that uh, globally we have also seen, because of the credit crunch, we've seen the reverse, especially in America and in the UK, some companies are now reversing back. They're actually coming back to their home turf with their service centers and things like because of the backlash that they're getting, that they're exporting jobs abroad, denying you know, locals employment. So there's a reverse of this particular trend. Of course, when it comes to Africa, majority of our businesses, international ones, may have you know, their call centers, service centers abroad, but we've seen tremendous number of them actually having their centers within this country, uh, you making use of you know, local, local content you know, policies, uh, making use of local expertise. So for us, in our case, we've seen quite a number of companies have their own service centers in this country. You know. All right, so I think this, is, it, this brings us to the end of the session of uh, how financial services are actually distributed. Now we've seen a myriad of uh, where we've seen various platforms through which we distribute financial services. We've looked at the traditional platforms like the personal selling, you know, in banking, you know, kind of uh, uh, what do you call service distribution. We've seen the use of brokerage, the use of agents, you know, for distributing financial services. We have also seen, you know, the use of technology, you know, as a predominantly, you know, used by the commercial banking and we've seen that there had been a lot of uptake in internet banking you know mobile banking and then in quite a number of uh, other in you know, a technologically based platforms now we have said that the distribution element of the financial services marketing could be divided into two the indirect and the direct where the direct company uses its own resources its own infrastructure to deliver you know the goods or the services and the indirect, we have seen the use of third parties, you know, in channeling the financial services to the consumer. We have also looked at the challenges facing the industry in terms of, you know, risks. We talked about the moral hazards where agents may actually misrepresent or may actually want to sell, you know, uh, at lower prices in order that they can get, you know, contract, they can get policies. They, we've seen where agents may not do due diligence in terms of risk profiles of consumers just because they want to get a business. We've also seen uh, risk, uh, what, we call, what we call adverse selection, where consumers may be somehow dishonest and may not necessarily disclose you know, certain information just because they want policy. You know, so these are some of the things that we have actually seen or we've actually, you know, learned in today's session when it comes to distributing financial services. And we're saying that because of the characteristics of the services element, heterogeneity, you know, perishability, intangibility, it makes the distribution part of the financial services very, very complex. All right. Thank you so much. I hope you have enjoyed the session and I'm now ready for questions, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Doc. Yeah. It looks as if the firms that choose the indirect approach in marketing as opposed to the direct approach are faced with the issue of the omissions and commissions of the channel members. So what are some of the things that 
the firms can do to ensure that the objectives of the channel members are in sync with theirs to avoid this? Okay, I think that's a very good question. Obviously, the companies will have their own objectives going forward. A broker or an agent has an objective of growing, and as a result, you know, they could have their own agenda. Now, I think in large part to ensure that you can reduce the issues like you talked about the omissions or commissions of issues uh, i mean of uh, fact or what we call the you know uh, moral hazard and you know, uh, adverse selection now when businesses are able to have you know a relationship such that it is almost like you know a, a win-win relationship i.e can they organize seminars together can they organize uh, uh, or can they do planning together like corporate plan, you know, sessions where they sit and say, okay, this year our corporate objective is this, and we expect that our partners, uh, the agents and brokers, can actually come along with us on that path. So once you organize some of these sessions to, for your partners, you know, to understand the way forward for you and how you want to actually pr pr uh, pr uh, proceed, I think that there could be a kind of movement mentality. There could be one approach going forward. Now, I think also that another good way of making sure that you can reduce issues of you know uh, what we call hazards and uh, adverse selection is about selecting you know companies that are or that have similar mindsets with you that is have the same objectives. So it is not every agent that you would let them represent you. There is not every broker that you want to want them to represent you look at the selection criteria very very you know critically and say that i really want agents that actually think like us that have similar objectives like us that want to move on the same trajectory as us so i think the agents agency selection and, and brokerage selection is key as well to get people who are like-minded or companies who are like-minded you know going forward and then, of course, we talked about the exclusivity, you know, fair share, giving people their fair share, making sure that they feel protected, you know, in the industry so that they wouldn't be, like, trying to cut corners in order to survive. So if you can guarantee people their survival or they are getting business from you, they can do a good business with you as well. So I think that could be some of the measures that the companies, financial institutions can actually take into consideration, you know, going forward. Okay, thank you so much for today's session as well. As usual, I think it's been interactive. I've loved it, you know, uh, looking at this uh, distribution of you know, financial services. I hope that, you know, you've taken quite a lot on board and you will take it to your respective places in terms of, you know, looking at, you know, whether we have actually challenge of adverse selection, do we have challenge of hazards, think through how some of these problems could be actually surmounted or could be dealt with at their respective businesses or at respective companies. And I'm sure that if we can actually you know, arrest some of these challenges, the industry could be sanitized, especially when it comes to insurance. You know, that's where the challenge of some of these things are. And then, of course, loan delinquencies and things could actually be reduced. Companies be, will be profitable. Customers and consumers will have value. And employees would also have value. Thank you so much for joining us in this session. Hope to see you next session. Thank you.